The story of St. Silhan the Athenite is pretty well known to most Orthodox people these days. But just in case you haven't heard of him, the very brief story is that he was a Russian man who became a monk on Mount Athos at a young age. And very early in his monastic life, he was given an abundant amount of grace from God. And he had a vision of Christ and came to know the Lord in a way that most people never do. But then he lost that grace, uh, not necessarily by a sin, maybe by the sin of pride. Um, but for 15 years, he battled, he stayed up keeping vigil, trying to pray all night, every night. He battled against uh, visitations of demons and, and just this darkness of knowing he had seen the light and then, and then lost it. So 15 years of struggling like this, and one night he's at his prayer vigil and he wants to just make a reverence, to, to bow down before Christ. And a demon appears in front of him to try to trick St. Silouan into worshiping him instead. And so St. Silouan is just like worn out. He's exasperated. And he sits back and asks the Lord what to do. And he hears God speak in his heart. And God says, the proud always suffer from demons. So St. Silouan asks the Lord, Lord, how do I become humble? And he again heard the voice of God in his heart, and it said, Keep thy mind in hell and despair not. Keep thy mind in hell and despair not. This became the the trick that brought St. Silouan back into the fullness of the grace of God, into an even greater experience and communion with God. And it was the legacy that he passed on to his disciple, who is now also a saint, St. Sophroni of Essex, and who started a monastery in England. And that monastery has continued to spread this word that God gave St. Silouan throughout the world. And this word has become really an instruction and a, a guiding beacon for very, very many people in the modern world today. But what, what does it mean to keep your mind in hell and not despair? It means this very delicate balance of being painfully, acutely aware of your own sin and shortcomings and uh, unworthiness, and at the same time being equally deeply assured of the mercy and goodness of God. Those things will keep us in, in balance there. So this knowledge of our own sin is really the foundation of the spiritual life in Christ. Because once we know our own sin, that leads us to trust in God. It leads us to depend upon him and to look for him. As long as we are oblivious to how much wrong we are doing, then we have like a big wall between us and God. Because we're still trusting in ourselves. We haven't yet learned how much we need God. So... The disciple of St. Silouan, St. Sophroni, he described this path, keep your mind in hell and do not despair. He described it in a slightly different way also. He said to walk on the very brink of despair, and if you feel like you're about to fall in, then sit back and have a cup of tea. Which is wonderful. <laughs> um, so what does that mean? That means that if it comes to a point where the pain of knowing your own sins, the pain of looking at your failings, begins to overwhelm you, begins to get too dark, then we need to step back and remember the goodness of God and look up at his light. But there's, there's a slight problem. So what if, what if you're already in despair? <laughs> what if that, you know, walk on the brink of hell 
and or the brink of despair and if you feel like you're going to fall in sit back well what if you always feel like you're about to fall in that's a that's a problem for a lot of people these days with the decomposition of faith and family life in our culture we, we've lost a lot of the fortitude of our soul uh, most people these days can't handle very much of that looking into the abyss before they fall in and so the good news is that there is a, a counterpart to this word, keep your mind in hell and despair not. And St. Sophroni taught that they were the same thing, but there were two different ways of doing it. And the other way, he said, is this. To always pray, I thank thee, O God, for everything you've given me, although I am unworthy. So to see how these two things are the same, uh, let's remember that the word was originally given to St. Silwan because he asked the Lord how to become humble. So the, it's a, the path is a path of, of undoing our pride. Now, there are two manifestations of pride. And the first one is the one that's most obvious, what most people think about, that is being overconfident of yourself, thinking too much of yourself, trusting in yourself, always depending upon yourself, and expecting everyone else probably to, to think just as well of you as you think of yourself. But the other manifestation of pride is despair. Now, that might not look like the same thing, but we can only despair if we expected ourselves to do something, we didn't do it, or we think we should be able to do something we can't do, or we should be able to control life in a way that we can't. They both, whether it's despair or, the, or, or being uh, pompous, they both come back to a trust in ourselves. So like we said before, if we don't yet know our own sins, then we're still trusting in ourselves, and that trust in ourselves is a big wall between us and God. There are likewise two kinds of humility that go along with the two kinds of pride. The first one is the more common path, and that would be to know our failings and to think better of other people than of ourselves. And that would be accompanied by a, a lack of judgment, a lack of anger at other people, and uh, instead a tendency to look for the good in other people, to see other people's virtues, realizing that you yourself need to learn, you need to learn from everyone around you because we, I'm making lots of mistakes. And that would be the kind of humility that would correspond, correspond with keeping your mind in hell and despairing not. The other kind of humility is uh, a little less common, and St. John of Climacus mentions it very briefly in his chapter on humility in the Ladder of Divine Ascent. And he says that even in his day, it's very rare, but that there is a humility that is formed in someone because of the abundance of the gifts of God. That when someone sees that the Lord has given me more than I deserve, the Lord has been so good to me, and every day he does more good to me, and I did nothing to deserve it. This is the other form of humility. And that is the kind of humility that would correspond with the, the second path of, I thank thee, O God, for everything you've given me, although... I am unworthy. But both of these forms of humility are about helping us to see our darkness and the Lord's light. In the keep, keep thy mind in hell and despair not, that path, we see our darkness first. And that vision of our own darkness compels us to look for the light of God. 
on the other side, the other path of gratefulness, in that path, we look first up to God's light. And in the vision of his goodness, our own darkness is revealed. So I think at this point we can see how these two paths are, are different sides of the same coin, you could say. They are um, two ways of, of walking the same road. But how do we know which path is the one that we should take? Well, that would largely be determined by which of the manifestations of pride we struggle with. So if I'm more inclined to uh, show off, to uh, build my reputation, to seek for praise, to people please, to um, manipulate other people, th these forms, this, this sort of pride, then the path for me is going to be to keep my mind in hell and to spare not to continually be painfully aware of how much I'm doing wrong, but at the same time trusting that God is merciful and good. But if, if my pride is more manifested in despair, sadness, self-hatred, then the path for me is going to be to give thanks for all things, remembering that I did nothing to deserve what God has given me. But it's important to notice here that self-loathing is equally a sin with ostentatious pride. Um, we have a tendency to sort of excuse the more uh, negative side of pride, you could say, as, as sort of a victimization, because the only way that we learn to hate ourselves is if someone has treated us badly at some point, and normally as children, the only way we have to make sense of that is to say, well, I must have deserved it. It's obviously my fault, because a child can't, can't understand that things in the world are happening that have nothing to do with them. Their world is still uh, very much so revolving around themselves. And the circumstances that teach us self-hatred are not our sins. That is not our guilt. But if once we've been hurt, then we continue the pattern and start to hurt other people, then it becomes our sin. Maybe we've inherited something that's not good, and that's not held against us. But it is up to us to turn that into something better. Now, we might think that self-loathing is not hurting anyone else except ourselves. But sadly, that's not true. Um, besides the, the obvious fact that people who hate themselves treat the people around them badly, especially the people close to them. So we do end up hurting other people. But most importantly, if we hate ourselves, we are hating God's creation. In fact, we were each made in the image of God. And so if we hate ourselves, we are hating the image of God. That's a problem. That's a big sin. And something that we need to repent of and not accept as if it were just a natural consequence of our life circumstances. But the good news is that we have remedies for all, all the types of pride and all the sins there are. The church has a big, a big medicine cabinet and it's full of all sorts of very useful medicines. But uh, we have to find the right medicine for us. If we, if we have a, a sweet disposition and we take the sweet medicine, we're going to get sick. And if we have a bitter disposition and we take the bitter medicine, we're going to get more sick. If we're sweet, we need the bitter. And if we're bitter, we need the sweet. We, we need to balance our souls out. And this is why 
for most people, at least upon their initial inclination and introduction sort of to, to the, the medicine cabinet of the church, we are immediately going to run towards the thing that will make us more sick because it feels comfortable to us. So if I have the tendency to condemn myself and, uh, and, and beat myself up and hate myself, then I'm going to hear, keep your mind in hell and despair not, and I'm going to run with that. Yeah, I can keep my mind in hell because the, I, I already have. I've already done it without ever realizing that we're not doing it the right way. <laughs> and if you tend to be uh, inclined to sort of excuse yourself and let yourself self off easy, then when you hear that there's a path of just giving thanks, you're going to say, oh, yeah, I can do that. No problem. Oh, thank you, Lord. You know, and then you don't realize that you just became the Pharisee. <laughs> um, so the medicine we need is normally the one that's hardest for us to accept because it's going to, we're like, we're kind of crooked in this way and it's going to pull us back straight to this side, but it's going to pull us. It's going to, it's going to make us change. And so that's uncomfortable. And this is why we have the tradition of spiritual fathers and mothers in the Orthodox Church, because we don't see ourselves clearly. We need help. We need guidance. We need someone who can look at us clearly and unbiased and, and help us to find the right medicine for our soul. So healing is available. The church is full of good medicines, and there are many ways in which each of our individual pains and wounds and sins can be restored to rightness. There are many different opportunities that the church gives us to pursue the right virtue, to correct the right mistakes. And there is a path that will be just right for us. So may St. Simeon and St. Sophroni intercede for you and help you to find the right path for your soul's healing. Amen. Yeah.